Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this special edition of Bang the Book Radio here. I'm joined by Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We're a chat about the PGA Championship at Bethpage Black to start things off. Second half of today's show, we'll chat about the Preakness Stakes at Pimlico Racecourse, the second leg of the Triple Crown. We will not have a Triple Crown winner this year. Country House not in the Preakness, but still have plenty to talk about with that race here coming up this weekend in the Baltimore area. We'll have pre- over at bangthebook.com. I've got my PGA Championship preview up over there as well. So lots of good things going on, including coverage of the NBA and the NHL playoffs, daily Major League Baseball stuff, soccer, tennis, NASCAR, MMA, lots of good things going on over at bangthebook.com. Make sure you head on over there and check it out. As you know, this 10 every edition of Bang the Book video presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code 100% 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at Bet DSI. It's only a game until you bet it. We start things off on the golf side here today with Brian Blessing. Brian, how's it going today, man? Hey, Adam. This is a great time of year, man. You, we keep thinking it's the downtime. You get the PGA. Uh, you had the NBA draft lottery. Head for home in hockey. Baseball's rolling right along. Um we're doing season win total videos, uh, doing division previews at Bang the Book. There's no downtime, kid. No, no, there definitely isn't. You've been doing a great job churning out those videos. Head on over to our Bang the Book YouTube page, Brian Blessing, all over that with a variety of different videos. And once we get a post draw here for the Preakness, we'll have a video from Brian for that event coming up here this weekend as well. But Brian, you did preview the PGA Championship for us over there. And Let's go ahead and start with that here at Beth Page Black in Farmingdale, New York. We've got some course form data here for this uh, track there in the Empire State because we had a couple of U.S. Opens, a couple of FedEx, one FedEx Cup playoff event, and then before the FedEx Cup playoffs began, there was one of the late season events there as well. So we do have a little bit of an idea of how this course might play. It's going to be long. It's going to be a beast, and they got a boatload of rain. So the players are saying that they're actually pleasantly surprised. I think the forecast is going to be dry the remainder of the week. But they said that the greens still had some bounce to them, and they should speed up. But the one thing that all that rain is going to do, and we'll see how they manage it and cut it down, is that the rough will be, at least now, is a little thicker than maybe they anticipated. It's wet and it's gnarly. Uh, it's the PGA. It's not the U.S. Open. I mean, if you go in the rough uh, on a track like this in the U.S. Open, it, it's, it's almost automatically a shot penalty. That may not be the case here, but you're asking for trouble if you're not playing from the fairway on this course. Yeah, and, and this is a long course, about 7,400 yards. It's only a par 70 as well. So, um, you know, you mentioned the rain. Maybe that'll help guys get uh, some low scores out there. But, you know, I did see some videos talking about the rough already, and like you said, you know, this is the PGA Championship. This isn't the U.S. Open. This isn't, you know, USGA punishing players for bad shots. The PGA doesn't want to do that to its players because this is its signature event. So, you know, what sorts of players are you looking at here? Are you looking for bombers? Are you looking for guys that hit it in the short grass all the time? What are you looking for this week? Well, I do think, you know, length is going to be a factor. And, you know, the bottom line is, you know, all these guys are long. I mean, you know, there's the Zach Johnsons of the world and uh, guys that don't hit it a million miles. That doesn't mean they can't contend because uh, the one thing that's generally the rule of thumb, if you're a shorter hitter and you're going to survive on the PGA Tour, you're playing from the fairway. So, yeah, you'll have a lot longer shots coming in, but if you're having a good week, it doesn't mean a short hitter, you know, can't contend. You know, that being said, I mean, you know, Kepka hits it a mile. He's a major machine. Tiger's driver's been spectacular. You haven't seen him since the Masters. The putter's kind of been, if you think, you know, what has been the weaker part of Tiger's game, it's inconsistency with the putter. It was always the driver that was killing him. Now he seems to have the driver figured out. Golf's such a goofball game. I mean, it's funny. I'm, I'm just an idiot. I play golf but it's forever, and I'm no spring chicken, but I can still hit it. I, mean, I used to be able to stand up, walk on the tee, and just hammer and drive 250 down, you know, play a nice power draw. And, and my dry, my irons and my short game and the putting, everything was a train wreck. 
now my irons and my chipping and my putting are terrific, and the driver, I'm a disaster. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing how it's so hard to put all facets of the game together. And, you know, even a goofball like me, here, here's Tiger. He, the driver killed him. Now the driver's great. If he, and if the putter's good, he's back. It's just a question of how his body holds up on a week-to-week basis. But the price is the deal here, Adam. You know, eight to one. Uh, it's a great story. He's a popular guy. He's polarizing at the windows. He won here in 2002. The price sends me elsewhere. I, honestly, to me, if you wanted a strategy with Tiger, it would be hoping he's, you know, four or five shots off the pace on Friday. And then, you know, 18, 20 to one, you get him going into the weekend and he, you know, shoots a 66 or something on a Saturday and he's back in it. So to me, if I'm get, it's like in-game wagering, you know, I'm, I'll wait for Tiger. I'm so bad. Tiger doesn't get to the front and then and say, hey, he's got the pedigree in the back class. That's the beauty of golf is you can reload on Friday night or not necessarily where you can reload if you're hopelessly out of it, but you can also then massage it with guys you think are going to contend with the guys you still got in it. Well, before we take a look at some other specific players here and kind of go down the odds board, I do want to ask you about this because I think this is an intriguing angle to maybe consider here. Usually the PGA championship played in August. This time around it's played in mid-May. And we've talked about this a little bit with regards to other majors and other events that have been played that, you know, guys are playing different tournaments. Guys are, you know, managing their workloads a little bit differently because of how the schedule has been set up this year. So how much is, how much of that is factored into your handicapping of this tournament? The idea that now we're in mid May, we're what five, six weeks removed from the masters guys have been playing these different events in between. We have maybe a little bit more recent form data with some of these guys than we would have had in the past. So how is that factoring? Well, it's a great point. I mean, Dustin Johnson specifically was asked about that, that usually the PGA was at the end of a four-week cycle. He played the British Open. I think he played the Canadian Open. And then he'd go to Firestone and then play the PGA. Well, Dustin Johnson is now coming off the shelf. And it's, it's a completely different animal because of the condensed schedule. So he said it's different, uh, and, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, he doesn't know how he'll react. He says he thinks his game's in good order. But he, the Shambo, Tiger, and you're seeing a lot of guys coming off the shelf in a four- or five-week layoff. So, yeah, I think that's a thing, and it could lead you to other guys. And, and honestly, the other thing you should take into account uh, is the crowd. New York, these fans are nuts. And I got two of the Spaniards, and because I always think there's a subplot with all sporting events. And if you remember, Sergio Garcia was just brutalized by the fans in New York when he had he just couldn't pull the trigger. He was like, remember that Kevin Na when he couldn't swing? Sergio was doing these endless waggles back in 2002. They destroyed him. He's vilified there, and he hates the fans right back. But Sergio's playing good golf. He hits it a mile. He was just second teamed up with Tommy Fleetwood, who I also like in this tournament, and they teamed up in the Zurich Classic. And it would be one of these things to see, can Sergio, if he were to play well and got on the weekend, I can see the New York fans actually turning around and rooting for him. I mean, that's a bizarre subplot. But I mean, they'll either terrorize him and he goes sideways, or he, he wins the fans over as the weekend goes on. And I think and I think Garcia is a different guy because everything's house money for him now because he's got the green jacket. Well, of course, that's the question for somebody like Ricky Fowler. You know, can he get over that hump? Sergio Garcia getting over that hump, getting that green jacket, playing without that monkey on his back. You know, that's something we kind of look for from Ricky Fowler, who's out there anywhere from eighteen to twenty to one in that type of range here. Your favorite right now is Dustin Johnson out there in the market at nine to one, at least in the offshore market. You mentioned Tiger, eight to one in Vegas. He's around eleven to one now offshore at some places. Rory at ten to one. A lot of people are probably going to like Rory this week, as they do for most majors. Kepka are in that ten to one range as well as a guy that you know just plays very, very well in these types of events. And you know, it sounds like you're kind of looking to move away from the favorites a little bit here. You mentioned Sergio in the forty to fifty to one range, a guy that you like. Tommy Fleetwood, another one in that thirty to one range. Who else are you looking at here this week, Brian? Well, I kick myself because I think Xander Shoffley's got the game. The problem is he's he's not always one of the popular buzz guys, but he's got the game. 
And if 25 to 1, there's nothing wrong with that price. I think you always have to consider Shoffley. John Rahm is another guy, price still a, a tad low, uh, but at 16 to 1. He, he to me, I can, in a weird way, I can see Sergio winning the crowd over, but I can see them trying to go John Rahm into going haywire. Because John Rahm gets is really hard on himself. And these fans of New York, again, I think they're a factor in this tournament. Uh, another guy I look at, I think he's kind of got the game. And he's taken way too much money uh, for someone who's never done it. But and maybe sometimes the money should lead you in the right direction. But Patrick Cantley is only 30 to 1. I mean, obviously, this is a guy who should be, to me, 40 or 50 to 1. But I do think he's a guy you can take a look at. The, I'll tell you, there's two. History repeats itself. Lucas Glover won the U.S. Open here eons ago. He's 100 to 1. He's playing good golf this year. So, you know, you kick yourself at the end of the tournament. Lucas Glover actually won the thing. And then current form, Adam, how many times have I bemoaned the fact, I cannot tell you how many times I finished second in these damn things. And in Nevada, the top five is not offered. And it's, it, it befuddles the mind to me that they should offer the top five. The guy's 60 to 1 to win a tournament, 20 to 1 to be in the top five. More people would win. There'd be more churn. They'd bet other sports. Happened again last week. I had Scott Piercy at 60 to 1. And, you know, the Sun Kang kid, who I, I don't know. I know you were traveling. I don't know if you saw the tournament. This Kang, this Kang kid hits a ball out of the bunker on, a, I think, it's like the fourth or fifth hole. And the thing's going like it's hair on fire off the back of the green, and it's going to go off the green and into a hazard. And there's no one on the back corner of that green except three guys, three volunteers, like marshals and volunteers. And the one guy has a lawn chair sitting there, and the ball hits the guy's Gatorade bottle and stops on the top of the ledge. It would have gone, you know, Kane would have shot a triple. He'd have been out of the tournament. Scott Piercy would have won the tournament. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you know, of all, the, of all the things, you know. But Scott Piercy played last week. It hadn't happened. I think uh, Charles Howe may have been the last guy to do it. Scott Piercy played four rounds at the Byron Nelson Classic, bogey three. That's ridiculous. So Scott Piercy is 100 to 1, and he's coming in here. Now, he's not a long hitter, but he's he's going to hit all the fairways, and you know, he just shot 21 under part to Byron Nelson Classic bogey three, and he's 100 to 1. I mean, there's a current form guy. You're nuts not to play. Yeah, and in fact, you look offshore, you can find 125 to 1. He was 175 to 1 when I wrote my preview on Monday. So somebody out there uh, does like him. It doesn't take much to move around a price like that in a futures market like this. But still, somebody out there definitely looking at Piercy. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly agree with the way that you're going there. In that department, I'll throw you out a couple of names. I do like Cantley this week as well. He is a guy that I mentioned in the preview I wrote on Monday. Uh, first in par four scoring, that doesn't hurt at a, at a place like Beth Page. 15th in driving distance, 10th in strokes gained tee to green, 21st in strokes gained off the tee, just outside the top 50 in putting. And that's one of the big things here. When you look at the guys that are doing really well off the tee in the strokes gained department, a lot of them are not putting well. So when you find one that's putting pretty well, you know, that's certainly going to help you at a major event like this. That's why of the short prices here this week, I like Jason Day in that 20-1 to 1 range. We know he can hit the ball a long way. We know that he's pretty good on the approach. But he's also just outside the top 10 in strokes gained putting. So as long as he doesn't go and pick his daughter up before the tournament, I think he's got a pretty decent <laughs> shot here uh, in the 20-1 to 1 range. And I'll throw out a couple now, more you, for you, you here. You want him to. You want him to pick up his daughter. I'm telling you, this I've never seen anything like it. You know, he's falling down fairways with vertigo, uh, or, or he's got a bad – this guy always wins when he's hurt. That's true. That's you know, a, I forgot like, about the like vertigo a, thing. Movie. Huh? What was that? Was that Chambers Bay with the vertigo? Chambers Bay, yeah. He fell down the hill, rolled down the – you know, you know, went down ass over tin cups. He's rolling all around, and he was in contention until the final three holes. I mean, every time he's – what was it, the match play, the one year, and another term. He almost withdrew because he threw his back out. And he went on, you know, on the first day, and he goes and wins the thing. It's happened three times. He hurts his back, and, he, and he, he's right there, and he goes out of You want him hurt. Trust me. 
Find out what his <laughs> calamity is and bet more on him. <laughs> I like it. That's a, that's a good betting angle. With Jason Day's hurt, make sure that you bet on him. Uh, that certainly makes a lot of sense. I want to throw out a couple well, of names. Yeah, guys I'll never that... forget, I, I will never forget it because he beat me in the match play. I had Victor Dubuisson at like 150 to 1. And with the bad back, he beat Victor Dubuisson on the fifth extra hole. And back then, it wasn't even a thing. You, you couldn't even hedge. <laughs> you, could, you couldn't even hedge the thing. I got the guy at 150 to 1. You know, Jason Day's like walking around like uh, using the club as a cane, and he wins the tournament. You're, you weren't lying when you said you finished second all the time in these, were you? All the time. <laughs> all right, well, let's start, a, let's start a couple of other names here. Guys that we've talked about a lot here this week, and, and these are some, some balloon prices as well, so I do want to pick your brain on these guys a little bit here real quickly. Let's start with Keith Mitchell. I know Keith Mitchell's a guy that you've talked about quite a bit here so far this season. He's out there at 125 to one in the offshore market. What do you think about him this week? Why not? I mean, he, he showed he's kind of steely. I, I, here's the problem, buddy. I, like I said, I fired out the guys. Now I'm looking at this. Will, this always happens to me too. So I'll give you some guys that I bet on, and now they'll do it. I had Matthew Fitzpatrick in the Masters. Uh, I bet Cabrera Bello a bunch of times, and I, I you know what, I'm, I, I've got to do it because I, I'll kill myself. <laughs> I'm putting five bucks on Matt Waller. Uh, you know, I had him at uh, you know, a bunch of tournaments this year, and then the one week I didn't bet, bet him, he almost beat me down in Florida. Uh, he just lost on this past weekend. I think it's the British Masters. And he got beat. The guy he's playing with, the uh, Swedish kid, uh, poured a birdie in, a, in him on 18. So he literally lost on the last hole in the British Masters. So Matt Wallace is coming in here with good form. He's a guy nobody knows about. He's one of the best players on the European Tour last year. He's played a bunch over here. And he runs really hot and cold. But Matt Wallace is another guy uh, I'm starting to talk myself into. Speaking of the British Masters, I mentioned in my daily fantasy piece, Eddie Pepperell, who played really well over in the British Masters, is a guy not necessarily to bet from, a, uh, from an outright standpoint here, but a guy that if you dabble in the daily fantasy stuff, uh, he's a guy that was kind of on my radar. One other guy I want to ask you about here, Sung J M. I know that you've been on him a lot. I know that's a guy that's kind of stood out to you here for a variety of different reasons. One thing about this tournament is that you also try to get into the U.S. Open by being in the top 60 in the official world golf ranking. Sung J M, one of those guys that's very close to being on the cut line. He'd probably wind up getting an exemption or an invite anyway, but he'd certainly like to you know, get his own way into that major that's upcoming here, the U.S. Open. So he's got a little bit more than a win on the line here this week. Yeah, I mean, you know, those are guys I think you could consider – uh, you know, in matchups and things of that nature, and then see where it stands again. I think going going into on a Friday. Uh, here, here's the rub, bud. I mean, we, we you rattle off a bunch of guys that are contenders. I rattle off a bunch of guys. Uh, and, and when you think about it, uh, we haven't mentioned. You know, by the way, another one finished second. My top pick for the Masters was Molinari. You know, and he it was his tournament. He he, he gave it away. Um, so we haven't mentioned a Molinari. We have a message of Justin Rose. Uh, he now hits it a mile. DeChambeau's been gone for a month. DeChambeau's back in, in the hopper. And the one that's really crazy, I mean, Matt Kuchar's playing, having a great season. The guy would not think about this, how far he's fallen. And just Jordan Spieth, you know, with all the talk, every year at the Masters, it's this big thing. Oh, Rory's going for the career grand slam, right? Every year, it's this big, big thing. Jordan Spieth is going for the career grand slam this week, and nobody's talking about him. I mean, he's, he's, he wasn't hideous last week. He just has one or two bad holes. But it's amazing how Jordan Spieth has fallen. And his demeanor, man, if he gets down on himself and the fans get on him here, it could get ugly. But imagine that. He's going for the career grand slam, and if nobody, nobody's giving him a shot. You know, it's kind of funny because I feel like for a lot of these majors, you know, you and I either have kind of a consensus opinion or we have a, a pretty good idea, some pretty strong convictions about guys that we like. I look up and down the board here. I mean, you've got a guy like Gary Woodland at 55-1 to 1 who's playing very well. 
Bubba's played well here in 2012 and 2016. He's 55 to one. He hits it a mile too. Louis Oosthuizen always plays well when the lights are the brightest. He's kind of the original, like the OG yep. Xander Schauffele as a guy who always plays well in majors or stacked fields, something like that. Bills all the way down the board at 66. Poulter at 80. I mean, I, no, I don't think any guy winning this thing would surprise me at this no, point. No, it, it would not shock you. And generally speaking, uh, the PGA Championship is the one where, you know, uh, a world-class guy is likely going to win it. But it's the tournament where a Bob May or, you know, somebody uh, comes from out of nowhere. Uh, who is it? Why Yang? Why did Yang beat Tiger in his prime? Well, you know, and, and he stared Tiger down and beat Tiger. That, that, the PGA kind of lends itself to that. And, and we, again, you're right. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Uh, I see you, Louis. I had Louis. I, I always send a bouquet of flowers to Louis. I you had him in the British Open. Uh, but I've had him in all these Masters and all these tournaments. And, and, he, and he's frustrating because you know, he'll, he'll get you right there, tease you, and not win. I'll throw another one at you. And, again, I mean, you can only bet so many of these guys. But Henry Stenson's game is close. And he hits his three-wood as far as most guys hit driver. So Stenson plays from the short grass. He's just been a tick off, but he's showing signs of it being close. And, you know, to get a guy like Henry Stenson in the 60, 70 to one range is crazy. But it's been a while. But these are guys with back class and major pedigree. Well, again, I mean, I, to a degree, I apologize to our listeners here because, I mean, you know, we mentioned some guys at the top that we like, and, and those would be the guys that, you know, would be up at the top of the board. For me, guys like Day and Cantlay, um, you know, Brian will have you, uh, before we transition away from this segment, have you recap the guys that are your favorites. But we haven't even talked about Justin Thomas yet. We, we barely scratched the surface on Rory. Well, we we mentioned yeah, Molinari just, just, in passing. Justin, oh, Justin crazy. Thomas would have Justin Thomas would have been. I, honestly, I think he'd have been right at the top of my list. Uh, he had had the wrist injury, withdrew from the Wells Fargo. You're thinking he's just playing it safe to get here, but the, the wrist is just a no go. So Justin Thomas has got he, he had to withdraw. But there, there's another guy, uh, and, and you hope that's nothing because it's nothing to sneeze at with wrist injuries in golf. Uh, and he's a young guy, and you hope it's nothing serious. And uh, he's smart to, you know, shut it down and, and, and don't let that thing fester because, well, you get you get a wrist injury, it can derail a career. So as I mentioned, Day and Cantley, probably my top two guys here on the card. There are some guys in my preview over at bangthebook.com you can check out, and maybe you want to get invested with those. And, Brian, again, uh, just to recap here, I know you mentioned you like Sergio Garcia here this week. Who else are you definitely going to have a ticket on? Uh, as we head on into the PGA Championship? Well, I'm, I'm really close in terms of my, my top two picks. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with them in that, in that, that one drags the other along. Uh, Sergio and Tommy Fleetwood were paired up in the Zurich Classic. And they were right there, finished second or third. Uh, but on the final day, Fleetwood was throwing darts. I mean, if Fleetwood was playing his own ball on Sunday at uh, New Orleans, he'd have shot a 64. And I, I, I just I can't get it out of my head. Uh, if you remember the U.S. Open, he had about a 15-foot putt to shoot a 62 last year. Uh, Fleetwood's got a major game. And I think there's so many other guys that are kind of in, lumped in that group with a guy like Tommy Fleetwood that are, are this close to kicking the door down and getting their first major. I, I think Fleetwood, this could be his week. I really do. And, and, I, and Because this is the PGA, but it's the PGA on Beth Page Black, which is, which is, of course, right in the U.S. Open rotation. That's why Kepka's, you know, hey, he's playing great. But that's why, you know, Kepka is a, a monster opportunity to do it again. But don't forget, Fleetwood was the runner-up to Kepka at the U.S. Open. So I think the setup could favor a guy like Tommy Fleetwood and the price is right. 
if it's not here for Fleetwood, is it the Open Championship, do you think? Uh, the U.S. Open? I, no, I mean, I think the setup, a, a U.S. Open setup, and that kind of course Fleetwood can play. Uh, if he is dry, he's sneaky long. Uh, I, I think he's got every aspect of the game. Uh, it, it, and if, but he is sneaky long, and if he's driving the ball well, you know, I, to me, if you ask me, you know, I think I think Fleetwood, you know, should be maybe along the lines of what the price is for a guy like John Rahm. I, I mean, John Rahm is a terrific player, but I, I, I think Tommy Fleetwood is every bit the player that John Rahm is. And if you're asking me, I mean, Rob can win this week. He's one of the guys I, you know, I like. But if you're asking me who wins a major first, it would be Tommy Fleetwood over Rob. Um, you know, it, but again, there, there's so many guys, Adam. The, the field is so deep. Um, I, I like Fleetwood's game. I like his demeanor. I like everything about the guy's game. Uh, and honestly, I, I think he and he's a likable guy. I, I think the crowd could really get behind Fleetwood. I, I, if this tournament specifically, the crowd is a factor. I mean, the crowd is going to start riding some guys and they're going to go pear-shaped, or, or they're going to get behind a guy and push him. Remember how nuts they went for Mick? They loved Tiger, but they, they pushed Mickelson that one year and, and, and got Phil all fired up and he was in contention. The crowd in New York, these people are loud, they're fun, and they're obnoxious. I mean, this is a different tournament, man. I mean, the crowd is a factor. Well, we got three events here coming up. Charles Schwab Challenge, the Memorial, and the RBC Canadian Open before the U.S. Open as that returns to Pebble Beach. And then July 18th through the 21st, the Open Championship. Maybe if Tommy Fleetwood doesn't get this one this week, maybe that'll be the one that we look at there uh, in mid to late July. But go ahead. But we didn't, we we cursed over him a little bit. Uh, Dustin Johnson off the shelf. Yeah, you know, I mean, what are we telling you? He's number one in the world. But I, I think Dustin Johnson has to fall down to lose at Pebble Beach. Okay, all right. Well, we'll keep that in mind then for about three weeks' time from now and uh, see what his price point looks like there when we get to that. And obviously, of course, you know we'll see. I would think, and maybe this is just me. I, I don't know. I would think Dustin Johnson probably plays the next three events in, in advance of Pebble Beach, right? I mean, he, he usually plays the Canadian Open. He'll play the Memorial. A lot of guys play the Memorial. I have to think that you know, if you're worried about Rust a little bit here this week, that will not be a consideration for you for the U.S. Open. It will not be a consideration. And Johnson, he's won the uh, AT&T or the Pro-Am. He's won that a hundred times. And he had the U.S. Open won there. And gave it away uh, when McDowell won. Uh, no, I, I, I think I, I, I and, and think what Tiger did when the U.S. Open was there. Uh, is that one would not. Show, what a, what a, the U.S. Open is going to be great. I mean, I, I think that weekend that that's a Dustin Johnson, Tiger Woods, Brooks Kepka flat out shootout, and that will be a chalky event. Now, I think here you got to go price hunting. The U.S. Open is going to be chalky. All right, so for our listeners here that are listening to the full show, we're going to transition over to the horse racing side of things here. For our listeners that just listened to the segments, uh, this will be the end of the PGA Championship one, and you'll have to check out our next segment here, the Preakness. But, uh, again, over at bangthebook.com, my PGA Championship preview, some daily fantasy picks, then also on our Bang the Book YouTube page, Brian was nice enough to record a PGA Championship preview video for us, so you can check that out over there. 